So I'm going to attempt today to answer a question I get asked a lot. And I always just sort of have a sucky response to it. Um, and the question is this. How do you come up with your ideas? So disclaimer, I'm not claiming to be some amazing creative genius, right? I am one data point. But maybe something I could say from my experience can maybe help you in something you do in your life. Um, and the reason I get asked this, as mentioned, was three and a half years ago, this was my Halloween costume. And I had an iPad on the front and back. And if you do a FaceTime chat, it looks like you have a hole in your body, um, which is cool, right? Uh, my favorite part of the costume was that if the Halloween co po party you're at is a little bit lame, you could always uh, <laughs> play Angry Birds. Um, so as we kind of had this mic, uh, so basically put that video out. Um, it went sort of viral, 3 million views overnight, front page of CNN. Uh, the main complaint, though, is like, cool idea, bro, but I don't have $1,200 for a Halloween costume. <laughs> so basically, my challenge was to come up with like a cooler Halloween costume that wasn't quite as expensive, right? And so while working my day job as a NASA engineer on the Curiosity rover, that was like three months before we sent it to Mars, um, at night, I was working on uh, this, this, this concept, right? And so I called the company Digital Duds, and so this is kind of how it works. So you play a video on your phone, and you slide it into like a shirt. And so it's a really cheap, yeah, sorry, it's kind of big. <laughs> uh, it's a really inexpensive implementation of this concept, right? You buy a $20 shirt, and it's a free app. Um, yeah, apologize, that's very large. Um, and so the, the thing that I learned basically from this experience is that <laughs> I liked this feeling of putting something out there and having people see it and sort of getting that feedback and making it feel like you know, your creative efforts were appreciated. So I decided every month I would try and put out a YouTube video about a creative idea. Um, and so we started a YouTube channel and now it has like uh, it was way more than we first thought. I think it's like 42 million views on the site and like 190,000 subscribers, which is super cool. Certainly no PewDiePie, um, but, it's, but it's an exciting opportunity. Um, and so here are just a couple of real quick ideas that we put on the channel. So this is like, you put a GoPro on a ceiling fan upside down, it's like ghetto bullet time from like the Matrix, right? So this is just a GoPro that's spinning around. You play the footage back, it has this really cool uh, looking effect. Um, or this is if you put the FLIR, like an infrared, on, on the front of an iPhone. I'm actually stealing this woman's pin here because I figured out that certain keypads, if you touch the keypad, it leaves behind a thermal signature so you could see where they touched, right? And so I put this video out saying, like, dude, bad guys can use this. Simple solution is just rub your hand across all the keys when you're done, and then it leaves, like, a meaningless thermal signature. Um, another idea... Uh, is uh, uh, no mess watermelon smoothie, right? So you just get a coat hanger and a drill. Uh, it's really refreshing and slightly creepy. <laughs> Gotta stumbled upon that one. Um, and finally, this idea, if you use the front-facing camera on your phone and then take it to the zoo and put it like in front of the monkey exhibit, the monkeys see it and they're really interested. So you get this really cool footage with just, just a dumb phone, right? Um, and before you get all smug and laugh at the monkeys, I actually repeated this experiment on higher order primates as well. Uh, <laughs> so some of the videos have sound too, so if we could just turn the sound up a little bit, it's fine, but in the future, thank you. Um, so going back full circle, how do you come up with your ideas? Um, I think what people are really asking when they ask this is, how can I come up with more good ideas? Or like, how do I be more creative? Because there's this, there's this myth, and I like it because it tackles this myth head on, that you know, people are either creative or you're not. Like it's some gift bestowed from on high. Either you have good ideas or you don't. And that's not true. In my opinion, curiosity, or creativity is sort of like a muscle you develop. So for the next couple minutes, I want to just talk about like, how you develop that muscle, basically. Um, so there's three steps that I have kind of feel like I, I figured out. And for step one, we're going to go to the ancient city of Alexandria, 300 BC. They did something interesting here. Whenever a ship went into their port, they would board it forcefully. But the soldiers weren't looking for gold or spices. They wanted their books. They would take the books in the library and they would copy them. And as a result, they got this amazing knowledge, this database. It's like you know, Wikipedia of 300 BC of just all these experiences of people across the world. And we had people like Euclid and Archimedes who studied there. 
and they had incredible advancements because of this approach. They were really curious about the world around them. They observed it, and they tried to solve these, the, you know, these problems. There's this, this quote that I really like. The most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not eureka, but that's funny. And, and, the, and the key to all good inventions, if you think about it, even the scientific method, the first step is observation. It starts with observing the world around you. A great example of this is the microwave oven. Um, this was first invented by a guy named Percy Spencer. And he was working on a radar tube. He had a Mr. Good bar in his pocket, and all of a sudden the thing melted, which seems incredibly dangerous now that we know about microwaves. But he saw this thing melt, and he's like, well, that's weird. Like, that's funny. He had that one of those, that's funny moments. And so he observed that and went back and did some research and figured out what was going on. And from that, we got the microwave. Um, so the first step, I think, in the way to be more creative is to be curious. Um, and if you think about the most, like, creative group of people on Earth, I think it's probably kids. Like, my son could take a bucket and just play with it for, like, three hours. And that's amazing with kids is because they're always questioning and looking and observing and making connections about the world around them. And I think that sort of gets beat out of us, like, in the school system somehow. And by the time we're your guys' age, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just not creative, right? That's not what you said when you were in kindergarten. Um, I think the most creative people that I know that I respect are those who've been able to maintain that kid-like approach and view of the world. Johnny Ive is the head designer at Apple. Brilliant guy. And he says, it's, for him, it's almost like a curse. When he looks at objects and designs and stuff, he's always asking, like, well, why is it that way and not this way? It's like he can't turn that off. He's always asking that question. And Apple has this amazing way of making products um, there you go, uh, that just seem different, right? And this is a great quote about that. The difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as escaping from old ones. And a lot of times... You know, you can picture it almost like there's a hill, and everyone's trying to optimize and get to the top of this hill, and Apple sometimes can step back and just be like, oh, there's another hill over here that's really big, right? And so the hallmark of good design is when people can look at it and be like, wow, like, how did, how did nobody think of that before when the design in hindsight seems really obvious? I had an opportunity like this about a year ago. I was cooking a frozen burrito in my kitchen, and I'm like, Microwaves have not changed, it felt like, for 40 years. I'm like, like, what could we do differently? As humans, we rely primarily on our sense of sight. And so I figured since infrared, mi infrared lenses are pretty cheap now, it would be awesome if you could put your burrito in the microwave and you could see it cooking, right? So you get a heat map on the front of the microwave. You could visually tell when it was done. But it gets better because you could, like, put your bowl of soup in the microwave and then you could like go upstairs and be working, and then after four minutes, if it's not quite done, you don't see all white, you just like add 30 seconds. Um, so it's like a different approach, right? And this one actually has a happy ending because uh, I got a patent on this, and I'm working with like a couple of the big guys to get it into a Walmart near you. So <laughs> at some point, if you ever see this, just buy it. I don't care how much it costs, all right? <laughs> just buy it. Um, so. That's step one, being curious, right? So step two, I think, look to this thing called the Marshmallow Challenge. This guy named um, Tom Wujek does this. He's done it over like 70 times. And what he does is he gives people a challenge. He has some spaghetti, some tape, and some string, and a marshmallow. And he says, in 18 minutes, why don't you build the tallest tower you can with the marshmallow on top? And the fascinating thing about this, he's done it a bunch of times. And there's one group that consistently beats CEOs, uh, lawyers, and businessmen. And that group is kindergartners. <laughs> Seriously. And the reason why, he explains, is because, you know, the adults look at the situation, and first of all, the first three minutes is like a power struggle. Who's going to be the leader, right? And then once they sort of figure that out, they start building something, but they don't actually put the marshmallow on until the very end, at like minute 17. And marshmallows are deceptively heavy. And so then the whole structure buckles, and now they have nothing with like a minute left. Uh, whereas kindergartners, by contrast, they just start building right away. There's no power struggle, right? And kindergartners, instead of just putting marshmallow on once, on average they put it on four to five times. So about four minutes into it, they're already putting the marshmallow on top and sort of testing it. And so because of that, because they're sort of testing early and often, they're able to get to a solution that actually works. And it literally, consistently across the board, they do better. Um, so step two I'm calling... Uh, 
sort of work hard. And for every, like, design you see from Apple, right, behind the scenes, there's like 40 devices, prototypes that you've never seen. Thomas Edison said he came up with, you know, 10,000 light bulbs before he found one that worked. Um, uh, James Dyson, the inventor of, like, the cyclone thing, said he had 5,127 uh, 5, failed prototypes before he had a, micro, you know, a vacuum that actually sucked. Like, sucked, like, in the sense that, like, it sucked. It was good, right? I mean, that was, like, a success, right? Um, the point is, is, like, whatever you do, do it. Like, if you're, like, a sculptor, just sculpt. If you, if you, you know, paint, just paint a ton. If you like photography, don't say, oh, I'm just not a creative photographer. Just go out and take a ton of pictures and fail and learn from basically what you're doing. Um, and, you know, by doing this, you sort of discover, you know, you fail and you learn and you get better. Um, it's interesting to note that the guy who invented the, 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 the microwave, you know, other people had actually had the, the chocolate bar melt in their pocket, but he was the first person to actually do something about it and to actually have that, like, kindergartner's approach of curiosity and trying to figure out what was going on there. Um, so I actually had an experience where I kind of... Uh, implemented steps one and two uh, a, little, a little while ago where I remember reading as a kid that if, you know, people will swerve more on the road to hit turtles than they would snakes, which always seemed interesting to me. So I actually ran an experiment. So I had the curiosity and I went out and I placed by the side of the road um, alternating like snakes and turtles, right? Um, and then I collected data <laughs> in a lab code so it looked official. Um, and it turns out my hypothesis was wrong. So, like, actually, uh, people did swerve to hit snakes more than turtles. But there are turtle, turtle killers amongst us. Um, I know, right? <laughs> Messed up. Um, but what's interesting is that some people are really cool. Like, this lady was really nice. And she started throwing plums at my rubber snake. <laughs> To encourage it to like get off the road. Um, it didn't move. It didn't move in the end. Um, or this guy. Um, this guy. Yeah, he was like, I thought he was trying to get the tarantula to safety. That's cool. But then he just, <laughs> then he got in his car and just ran it over anyways. Uh, or this guy. He was cool. Like he was saving the snake. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then he's like, oh, it's fake. I'm going to take this home and like give it to my wife or something. And so, <laughs> hey, that's my snake. I'm right here. I'm trying to do some science. So in hindsight, <laughs> I think, I think my mistake was trying to appeal to his love of science. <laughs> like that was the disconnect. Um, but this is a great example of, like, when I told people I did this and I, I released a video of it, you know, people were like, wait, so, like, you, you, you were crouched in the bushes for, like, 10 hours, like, videoing cars and stuff? And I'm like, yeah. And for a lot of people, they're like, you're weird, you're crazy. But that's sort of the point. Like, part of the creative process is just putting in, you know, the elbow grease, putting in the time. Um, so for step three, this is supposed to be blank, you guys. Um, so for step three, um, I think it's important to think about our concept in general in society of what creativity is. Um, back in, people have noted this, but with the Romans, we actually get the word genius from them. But to them, what a genius was, was like a troll that lived in your walls. And at night, when you like had your piece of art you were working on, it would come out and like sprinkle like creative dust on your work of art. And this had an interesting impact because if you were really good you're kind of humble about it because you're like, well, I just got a really good genius, you know, that lives in my wall. But if your work is kind of sucked, then, you know, it's like, well, what could you do? My, my genius is kind of lame, right? So it's like, there's, what could you do? And the um, sort of benefit of thinking about it this way is it sort of takes it out, you know, takes you a little bit out of it. And I think that's the truth lies somewhere between the way we think of genius and the way the Romans did. You know, I don't believe, you know, even partially that there's like little trolls living in, their wall, in your walls, but there is important to note that the part of the creative co process 
It's just about getting lucky. Um, there's an interesting book called Good to Great, and this author interviewed a bunch of CEOs, and 10 of them, of like supposedly these companies that will never fail, awesome ones. And she tried to find, or he tried to find the common th like thread, the thing that connected all of them. And what I appreciated is all 10 of them mentioned that, you know, a lot of what happened, they just got a couple lucky breaks. Like, they got some, they got lucky. Getting, certainly there was some skill involved, but a lot of it had to do with luck. Um, and as humans, we don't like that. Like, we try to assign a reason for stuff. There's a, there's a fancy term called hindsight bias, which is when we look back at points that are actually random, we try to connect them and create a narrative. Um, as an example, like, if there was 1,024 of us in this room, and I gave each one of you a quarter, and I said, flip that 10 times, statistically, one of you would get 10 tails in a row. And what happens usually is the media swoops in, and then, you know, it's like, oh, let's look at Kevin. Like, you know, he got 10 tails in a row. Look at his flip technique, you know, and his fingers and the way his wrist was and how his elbow and his posture. Um, like, that's what we do. Um, and it's funny, even returning on that point with good to great, of the 10 companies, two of the CEOs she profiled were the CEOs for Circuit City and Fannie Mae. Because uh, the book was written, like, 10 years ago, right? Which we know, right? Didn't work out so well. Um, so whether you call it like luck or karma or blessings, I think it is helpful to think there's some part of this process that's a little bit out of your control. Um, because then if you're Thomas Edison and you've built 9,999 you know, light bulbs, you don't say, I give up. Because you realize you just need to trust the process. Or if you're James Dyson, you built 5,000 vacuums. It's like, trust the process and keep going. And I'm not saying, don't misinterpret it, that being creative is just, it's all luck. But my point is, is as you are creative and you observe and you, you know, question your world, as you work hard and you, you build early and often, you increase your chances of getting lucky. You're basically giving yourself more quarters to flip so you can get ten tails in a row. And so my punchline today is that I believe we are all more, like way more creative than we give ourselves credit for. It's just about understanding the process. So, returning full circle, how do you come up with your ideas? For the first time ever, the most unsucky response I've ever given, I'm proud to say, the key is to be curious, to work hard, and to get lucky. Thank you.